happy Father's Day to all the men out there in our congregation. We're so glad that you're here and joining us today or whenever you've joined us. From wherever you're at, we're just thrilled that you're a part of this family today. Now, hear a little bit about what's happening in the life of our church. Now, as many of you have heard at this point, we are actually preparing to open up the church for in-person services on July 4th. Now, it's going to look a little bit different, and we will be limited with what we can actually do. So let me tell you a little bit about how this is going to look. First off, we are actually going to be adding an extra service at 9 o'clock that will be available for registration to come to. So we're going to have a 9 o'clock and a 1030 service. We're going to be limited to 35 people in the sanctuary because after all of our staff and our worship teams, that's sort of where we're at. So 35 people, but over two services, 9 and 1030. Now, if you are not comfortable or if you were not able to get in quick enough on the registration, we will still be having a live stream service every Sunday at 1030. That's not going, going away. And you can come right here to right where you're at right now and there will be church service. It'll look a little bit different because instead of, uh, instead of us videoing it ahead of time like now, we will actually be, you'll actually see what's in the sanctuary at that time. It'll be live. So nine o'clock, 1030, and then 1030 is also our live service. Just so that you're aware, if you're interested in coming, coming in person, the registration forms will be sent out very soon, but it will have some rules because we have some ordinances still on us. First off, there will be, uh, the, we will require masks. There will be no singing at this time. I know, bummer, but um, masks are required, no singing. There will be an entryway and an exit. We'll be following all the rules that we can. Uh, the first Sunday, July 4th, we will not have kids ministry. So if we have kids, they'll all be with us together, and we will have some special activity packs set up for them, just in case. Um, as we continue on, we will let you know when we start to open up our children's ministry areas for all of that. But just so that you know, we can be excited about what's happening. Sign up for that is coming, but if you're still wanting to stay at home, if you're not ready for this yet, feel free to stay where you're at. We, will, we are committed to continue to allow you to worship and connect with us in, in either way. So I hope you're looking forward to that. Also, if you have kids, make sure that you have registered them for VBS and sports camp. They're starting to fill up already. I think we already have 45 kids signed up for VBS, so that is exciting. But registration is on our website, and if you need more information, feel free to contact the church office or Pastor Sylvia, and we would be more than happy to get all that information to you. So we hope to see you there. And finally, next Sunday, June 27th, we want to celebrate Pastor Calvin and his family for the 24 amazing years of service they've had here at Victoria First Church of Nazarene. Now, they're not going any place, but Pastor Calvin is transitioning to a, a different role out in the community. So it's not a goodbye, but we do want to celebrate them this week. So June 27th, we'll be doing a couple different things. First, we'll be having a drive-through from two to four where you can where you can drive up and say hi and talk and uh, reminisce a little bit and just celebrate them together in person. We're also, we are also putting together tributes and a love offering. If you want to participate in the love offering, you can either do that online through our website or you can give that off to the office and we'll make sure that it gets to the right spot. And more information about the tributes that we're putting together in our book can be found on our church newsletter that's sent out every Wednesday. If you need more information, as always, please contact the church office. We would love to give you more, but come join us next week as we celebrate everything that they have done for us. Well, that's about all for this morning, but make sure that you're keeping up to date with all the news and things that are happening around our church through our website, our Facebook, our YouTube, and through our newsletter. If you haven't signed up for that yet, you can do that right through our website, vicnazarene.ca. Now, let's join together in worship today.
will always be enough Cause nothing compares to your embrace Light of the world forever reigns you are more, you are more
Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough for me. Great is your love and justice, God of Jacob. You use the is from 1 Samuel chapter 17. Now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle. They were gathered at Soko, which belongs to Judah, and encamped between Soko and Azekah in Epes Damim. And there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. He had a helmet of bronze on his head and he was armed with a coat of mail. The weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. He had greaves of bronze on his legs and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam and his, spear, his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron and his shield bearer went before him. He stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he's able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, Today I defy the ranks of Israel. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all the ranks of, of Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah, fighting with the Philistines. David rose early in the morning, left the sheep with a keeper, took the provisions, and went as Jesse had commanded him. He came to the encampment as the army was going forth to the battle line, shouting the war cry. Israel and the Philistines drew up for battle, army against army. David left the things in charge of the keeper of the baggage, ran to the ranks, and went and greeted his brothers. As he talked with them, the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, came up from out of the ranks of the Philistines and spoke the same words as before. And David heard him. David said to Saul, Let no one's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Saul said to David, You are not able to go up against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are just a boy, and he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And whenever a lion or a bear came and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck it down. 
rescuing the lamb from its mouth. And if it turned against me, I would catch it by the jaw, strike it down, and kill it. Your servant has killed both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, since he has defied the armies of the living God. David said, The Lord who saved me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will save me from the hand of this Philistine. So Saul said to David, Go, and may the Lord be with you. Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a bronze helmet on his head and clothed them with a coat of mail. David strapped Saul's sword over the armor and he tried in vain to walk, for he was not used to them. Then David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these, for I am not used to them. So David removed them. And then he took his staff in his hand and he chose five smooth stones from the wadi and he put them in his shepherd's bag in the pouch his sling was in his hand and he drew near to the philistine the philistine came on and drew near to david with his shield bearer in front of him when the philistine looked and saw david he disdained him for he was only a youth ruddy and handsome in appearance the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the wild animals of the field. But David said to the Philistine, You come to me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This very day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head, and I will give the dead bodies of the Philistine army this very day to the birds of the air and to the wild animals of the earth, so that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord does not save by sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. When the Philistine drew nearer to meet David, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. David put his hand in his bag, took out a stone, slung it, and struck the Philistine on his forehead. The stone sank into his forehead, and he fell face down on the ground. I pray that the Spirit of the living God will bring these words to life as Pastor Calvin, my good friend, preaches and as we ready our hearts to respond to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Again, we want to offer a very happy Father's Day to all the dads and all the men in our lives that have made such an impact in building us up and making us the people that we are today. Won't you watch this video honoring our dads?
Thank you again, dads. And I hope you spend today honoring those dads and the men in your family that have made such an impact on your life today. Now, last week, we actually were able to celebrate something really special that because of COVID, not everybody was able to be a part of. But we had a baptism last week. It was an exciting time. And it was one of our teens that's actually graduating on out, Logan Rutherford. And so even though you weren't able to be there, we went ahead and we took video of it. So why don't you, help, why don't you participate with us as we celebrate Logan and this special time together? Thank you, God, for this day. We thank you for Logan and for this moment in his life. We pray your blessing on him and all of these family and friends that have come to celebrate today this uh, declaration of his faith in you. The way that Christ identifies with us in dying for us, but we also in baptism identify with Christ and recognize the ways in which God calls us into a life where we lay down our lives and also the way that God empowers us and gives us the same kind of power that was in the resurrection to live out a life uh, that God is calling us to. And uh, we just uh, are so happy, Logan, to be a part of your life, to be a witnesses to um, God's spirit working in your life and the way that he's calling you even into ministry and, and uh, the ideas of ministry in the future. And it's just an honor to be, be a part of this day. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can it live any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into this death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Jesus Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we may too live a new life. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Yeah, so what Jesus means to me, just as I, he's everything I believe in and, and how I live my life. And, and so just as I'm making this next step forward um, into university, and just leaving home. I just want to reaffirm my faith in God and Jesus and just walk that walk that path for the rest of my life and I'm ready to do that. And so I'm gonna start uh, day one today uh, with my baptism. Logan Scott Rutherford, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. What a wonderful thing to celebrate today. And it still warms my heart to be able to see what God is doing in the lives of our teens and our church family, even in the middle of this COVID season. I wish we were all closer together and able to celebrate these things the way we'd like to. But it's been so wonderful to be able to celebrate even in this way. So as we continue on with our service today, won't you join me in a time of family prayer? Heavenly Father, we give you the thanks and the praise for all the great and amazing, wonderful things that we have seen you do in the past weeks and months. Lord, we are so looking forward to this ever-approaching time where we get to be closer together and worship as one family um, in, underneath a roof, being able to hear one another and lift each other up in the same place. Father, I pray that you would guide us through that season. Today, Lord, we lift up our fathers. We lift up the men that have played that role in our lives. For the ones that have taught us about you. For the ones that have shown us the ways to go. For the way that they have built us and made us who we are today. Lord, we thank you. And Father, we also know that today we remember those that may be mourning the loss of fathers. Or perhaps that relationship wasn't quite what it should have been or what they wanted. Lord, we ask that you would be with those today. Father, we thank you for the example that you've given us to look to as who and what our fathers should look like. 
Lord, as we have celebrated together this baptism, Lord, I pray that you would continue to work in our lives and like this baptism represented, that you would wash us clean, that you would continue to change our lives, bringing us from death into life into this new resurrection in you. Lord, we pray that new baptism on this whole church as we prepare for these new steps of coming back together. Father, in this time, we also know that this church has so many needs, the people in it. We couldn't even begin to comprehend how much, but you know them all. You've heard the prayers. You've seen the needs. So, Father, we very simply ask today, Lord, hear our prayer. Where there is healing, Lord, we pray that you would go and heal. Where there is anxiousness, Lord, we pray for peace. Lord, fall, and, fall fresh and anew on us this morning. Lord, we pray a blessing on Pastor Calvin as he brings the word. Lord, I pray that the words would just penetrate our hearts, that you would sh uh, mold us and make us anew, that your spirit would teach us something today. And as always, we pray that we don't leave this the same as when we entered. So, Father, we look forward to what you're going to do. And in Jesus' name we ask it all. Amen. Good morning. For the past three weeks, we've been thinking about how God was working with the nation of Israel as they left the period of the judges and took up a monarchy. Even though it wasn't God's first choice, he works through the prophet Samuel to call Saul as the first king of Israel. Last week, Pastor Jimmy called our attention to the fact that Saul was the king we all would have chose. On the outside, everything looked great, but as he carried out his rule, it became apparent that his heart was turning away from the heart of God. And so God asked Samuel to anoint David as the next king and passes over Saul's heirs to the throne. Through Samuel, God retained the primary influence and direction of the kingdom, a kingdom that he was shaping to reflect his holiness, his order, and his love. It was a reflection of his heart. And now as we continue this journey of the heart, we come to one of the most iconic stories in the Old Testament. Even though biblical literacy is in decline in North America, and you would find a lot of people who don't have the ability to uh, relate to stories or, or know, have knowledge of some of the stories of the Old Testament. The story of David and Goliath is still one of the most recognized and remembered stories of ancient literature. The account of the standoff between the young shepherd and the giant ranks among literature's great moments for a couple of reasons. First, it surprises and delights us with the unexpected. All throughout this story in 1 Samuel 17, we're given little nuggets uh, that catch our attention. And I'm sure for the readers of the day, they were continually surprised almost by each line. David is the little brother caring for the sheep and sneaks into the battle only because he's bringing his brother's supplies as they camp out with the army. We know that God has chosen him and anointed him to be king, but we can't anticipate how or when this will happen. And then in the very next scene, he's thrown into this great battle, facing off in a fight to the death with the giant Goliath. The sheer difference in size between the young shepherd, David, and the man giant, said to be about nine feet, nine inches tall, accentuates the drama of the story and endears us to the character that we see in David. This is the iconic underdog story that still captivates our storytelling today. Think of any of your favorite movies or novels, and I'll bet you can identify at some point the underdog theme 
working to move your sympathy for the hero. We love rooting for the underdog. And that's why characters who are smaller in stature, are frail, uh, or don't have as much power, attract our sympathies. Harry Potter, Frodo and Sam, Oliver Twist, even uh, Remember the Titans or name your failed uh, sports team uh, movie when they come back in the end to beat the better team and uh, win the miracle on ice. In all of these stories, we identify with the hero because we can see aspects of ourselves in the hero. They're relatable. We are also measured down from time to time by the giants that we face and so we love rooting for the underdog and seeing that it's possible for the small hero to surprise and overpower the big scary villain. Might also why we enjoy being Canucks fans so much. And just as we were challenged last week that God looks inside to the character of the heart, here we see that the size and the appearance of the enemy may also lead us astray. And we can underestimate what God can do when we align our hearts to his. Nevertheless, David is an unlikely hero who faces overwhelming odds. And the second reason the story has held our attention much longer than other stories in the scriptures is that it reveals David's confidence in the face of this formidable and monstrous foe. It not only surprises us when David defeats the giant, it surprises us that David has a confidence and faith to even enter into the arena to fight. As Goliath taunts the Israelite armies, David's heart responds to defend the honor of God by challenging anyone who would defy him. We're told in the previous scene that God judges according to what's in the heart, and now we're given the example and evidence of the heart of David. He responds with faith and confidence that the God of Israel will deliver this giant into his hands. David courageously steps into the battlefield because he trusts in the power and the presence of God. David walks down the northern bank of the Valley of Elah and sets his sights on this massive figure. And I think the question he was asking himself was, How many giants am I going to have to take on today? See, there's this Goliath bloke, but I know he's got four other brothers, so I better take five stones just in case they aren't too pleased when this big brute gets schooled. Goliath bends over and leans on his shield holder and covers his eyes from the sun glaring on him and spots this little tiny ant. No, it's, it's bigger than an ant. It's slowly getting bigger. Oh yes, now he can see it's, it's a boy. They sent a boy. He's really puzzled. This contest is not just some random wrestling match to prove his personal strength. Goliath has been striding out to the middle of this valley for 30 days so that he can conquer the whole Israelite army and nation with one kill. This was common practice. Both sides would send one representative who would stand in for the armies and battle to the death. And you can see how this would dramatically minimize the fatalities of both sides. Each nation's hope completely depends on their representative. And so Goliath is really puzzled, but his confusion soon turns to anger as he realizes the nerve of this boy striding out to battle as if he was a champion. Goliath says, am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? Come here and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. And then David replied, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will hand you over to me, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. 
Today I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. David's confidence is remarkable. Despite his youth, his inexperience in battle, his weaponry and his size, he speaks to Goliath as if he knows exactly what is going to happen next. Now, a side note, his weaponry might have been the superior choice in this battle. You see, slingers in the ancient days were uh, like our marksmen or snipers today. They were well-trained. They were had a high degree of accuracy and could deliver these stones uh, with a high level of velocity. This isn't some schoolboy with a slingshot. No, this is a, a highly skilled sniper who's able to deliver this rock directly to Goliath's forehead with some speed. Goliath makes a move but he struggles to move with any speed under his 150 pounds of armor. And so David takes advantage and quickly runs toward Goliath, taking that stone from his bag and fixing it in his sling. And he begins to whirl it madly above his head. And suddenly he plants his right foot and he pushes off and releases the sling at the same time. The sound of thousands of men holding their breath while one stone whistles through the air is deafening. And then it hits. And Goliath's eyes spread wide, his knees buckle, and he collapses onto his face. And without a moment's hesitation, David keeps moving towards Goliath. He races up and pulls Goliath's sword out of its sheath, cuts off his head, and holds it up by the hair. The cheers of the Israelites spread across the valley and the horror of what has just happened hits the Philistines. This little Jewish shepherd has killed their guest, their giant. They're gobsmacked. They turn around with puzzlement written across their faces and run. Now I know the scene isn't anything new to most of you. You've Heard this story umpteen times from flannel graph to veggie tales. But have you ever noticed that this isn't just a story about an underdog? It's a story about unfinished business. If you picked up on the reference to Gath as we read through this chapter, you know that it's the town where Goliath is from. In verse 4, we read, A champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. Well, what's Gath got to do with it? Gath was one of the five Philistine cities that was closest to Israelite territory. When Joshua and the Israelites entered the land, they were told to drive out and take over these towns and claim, claim them for God. When Joshua then was at the end of his life, God reminded him that there were still large areas of land to be taken over, including the territory of these five Philistine rulers in Gaza, Ashdod, Ashkelon, Gath, and Akron. Perhaps David chose five stones, not for the five brothers, but to represent these five Philistine cities. And if you want to see an amazing archaeological work, look up the excavations of the archaeologist Aaron Meyer on the Tel Asafi. He believes this dig has uncovered the ancient fortified city of Gath, the home of Goliath. And what it shows is that Gath was one of the most significant fortified towns with temple worship, with smith works, and was the closest Philistine habitation to the Israelite borders. Earlier in Samuel, we read about how the Ark of the Covenant was captured and the Philistines moved it around these cities. But in each place, God brought a curse against them. Some scholars think that curse was actually hemorrhoids. 
And at one point, the Philistine god Dagon even falls down and loses his head. And maybe this is a foreshadowing of the beheading of Goliath and the defeat of the Philistines. The Philistines are pressing in on the Israelites. And even as Goliath comes forward, David knows that they should have been dealt with already. And David has confidence in the battle because he knows the battle belongs to the Lord. God promised Joshua and the Israelites that he would deliver these nations into their hands. And if you remember, God first said to Joshua, for the battle is the Lord's. See, David is referring back to the original promise and blessing that this land would be given to Yahweh's people. For whatever the reason, the job hadn't been finished, and that meant that Gath's giant was now threatening that promise and threatening the vision and the plan of God. The man after God's own heart responds to the purpose and plan of God and carries the vision forward, reminding the whole nation of the promises God had made to them. In the face of the threatening Philistine army, he steps forward in confidence and courage and readies the stone in his sling. Many years ago, Carrie and I were able to go with friends on a bike tour through the south of France. And unfortunately, we were not in biking shape when we started our first day, which ended up to be about an 80 kilometer ride up into the green vineyard covered hills surrounding Bordeaux. When we tried to get up the next morning, the stiffness in our legs was unreal. I immediately questioned how we were going to ride to our next destination as I was having trouble even standing and walking, much less riding another several kilometers. But as we got back on the bikes and started moving our legs and working our muscles, we slowly gained back enough mobility and strength to reach our next destination. Along our route were some epic hills, which climbed out of the Dordogne Valley and challenged our bodies and our wills. But on more than one occasion, we would hear encouragement from other bikers or even from cars driving by shouting this phrase, bon courage. You see, biking is so respected in France. And when you're loaded down with camping gear and heading up some of these steep grades in the summer heat, the French know that you need encouragement. Bon courage, good courage. We might translate it, hang in there, or you can do it, or be strong. But notice that the root of the word courage is the French cur for heart. Our courage and confidence come from the heart. As we align our hearts with the heart of God, we can be enlivened to take on the challenges that we face each day. And I can't think of a better parting word as I finish off my 25 years of ministry with you. Through this time, I've experienced the grace and love of a church community that is truly seeking God's heart. I've been encouraged by your faithfulness and forgiveness. I've been surprised at your generosity and love. And I can't express the privilege that it's been to serve you in this role and work with you in living out our faith. And now, as we're on the verge of coming out of one of the most challenging times our church has faced, I encourage you, bon courage. Take heart. Yes, there are many challenges ahead. And some of you are weary and tired from the last 16 months of isolation. Some of you are uneasy about the pace of life ramping back up to what it was before the pandemic. Some of you have been invigorated by the ability to slow down in this time and think a little more. Have some time for yourself. Some of you are so longing to see friends and family and be able to travel to see your grandkids. And some of you are feeling beaten down by life 
by sickness and relationship difficulties, by work stress. Take heart. You got this. Bon courage. And I pray that, like David, we all would find the courage to face the unfinished business of our lives and look at the new challenges that await us. Let us seek the mind and heart of God and turn our hearts toward him and ask him to give us the courage that we need for today. Amen. And now, may God bless you and keep you. May God smile on you and give you every good gift. May God look you full in the face and give you the courage you need for today. Amen. Let it go of every single dream. I lay each one down at your feet. Every moment of my wandering never changes what you see. I've tried to win this war. I confess my hands are weary. I need your rest. Mighty warrior, king of the fight. No matter what I face, you're by my side. If you don't move the mountains, I'm needing to move when you don't part the waters I wish I could walk through when you don't give the answers as I cry out to you I will trust I will trust I will trust in you I will trust in steady hand you are my firm foundation the rock on which I stand your ways are always higher your plans are always good there's not a place where I'll go that you're already stood when you don't move the mountains I'm needing you
look down for you In the middle of my pain I reach down further Calling out your name Always I'm searching For a long lost piece of heart I sought and found you Like a fire in the deepest part Quiet on the cheat. Quiet on the cheat. It's golf lingo right there, in case you didn't know. For all the men that have ah, uh, 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 same thing. Okay. No, that's like perfect. Shazam! It's the quality content we bring you at the Bubbly Boys. I should probably redo that one. No. Mm -hmm.